All right, good, mor good morning to everyone. It is good to, uh, to have everyone with us today. Hate to break up the fellowship there, but uh, it's about time for us to, uh, to get started. Uh, before we get started with our, our Sunday morning class, uh, we do want to make mention of those who are sick and who uh, might need our prayers. Uh, we want to continue to remember some of those folks who we've mentioned several times before. Uh, Judy Parsley continues to be in our prayers, Bobby Damarama, uh, Cora Gonzalez, uh, who is uh, John's niece, who has uh, inoperable cancer. Uh, also keep Cindy and Duane in our prayers as well. And then uh, Kenny Johns is going to have knee replacement surgery on April the 18th. Uh, so make sure that you uh, remember Kenny. Uh, I think he. I think he mentioned that it might take a couple weeks to get back up and out. Right? Isn't that what they told you, Kenny? Probably. Probably? Okay. So uh, so keep these folks in your prayers. Anybody else who we need to remember in our prayers, Mike? Yes, I want to say thank you for the prayers. The sister. How did that? Okay. So everything went well. Okay. 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 I think I saw another hand. Yep. He did pass away. Okay. All right. All right, anybody else who we, who we need to remember in our prayers? All right, let's begin with a, uh, a quick word of prayer uh, before we start this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, are thankful for this day. We're thankful for the opportunity to come and uh, dig into your word to, to study and to uh, grow. Heavenly Father, uh, we pray at this time as we uh, have just been talking about those who are sick. Uh, that you uh, be with those who, who need you, who have the various different issues. We pray that you continue to be with, uh, with Judy Parsley and Bobby Damarama. Uh, we ask your prayers uh, for Cor Gonzalez and the dealing with cancer. We know that there's not much the doctors can do at this time, but we pray that you be with her and her family. Heavenly Father, we pray that you be with uh, Dwayne, and, Dwayne and Cindy and uh, the different issues that they're dealing with. We pray that you encourage them. Uh, we also pray that you be with, uh, with Kenny and the knee surgery that is ahead of him. We ask uh, that you be with the doctors who will, uh, who will do that surgery. We pray for a swift recovery for Kenny so that he can be up and around and, uh, and feeling better at that point as well. Uh, we are uh, grateful for the, uh, for the surgery, uh, for the positive open heart surgery results that we saw with my sister. Uh, but we do pray for, uh, for Jessica's uh, father as he's going to have his back surgery. Heavenly Father, uh, we pray that you be with uh, the young family and the uh, passing of Hugh. Uh, we pray that you be with all of them and comfort them. Uh, we know that losing a loved one can be so tough, and we uh, pray that, uh, that you be with them as they uh, go through the grieving process. Heavenly Father, we pray that you be with those who, who might not necessarily be on our list, but who are dealing with issues. We know that we all have uh, different things that are going on in our lives. Um, you know, may not necessarily be physical sickness, might be uh, stress, anxiety. Uh, could be that we're struggling with the spiritual uh, side of things, where we've got sin in our lives and we know we, got, we, we need to do something about it. And we pray that you can uh, help encourage us to, to get to that place, to... Uh, make our lives right. Heavenly Father, we uh, pray that you uh, be with our study today. We pray that we can open our hearts to what your word has to tell us. We pray that we don't uh, come to it with a view of, uh, you know, trying to get to say what we want to say, but we pray that we can uh, be open to the message that it, it brings to us. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. All right, uh, just a, a few announcements. I know David often went through the remainder of the announcements, and I'll, I'll mention a couple of different uh, updates to you. Uh, 
ladies, you've got a ladies night out at uh, Mellow Mushroom in River City on Monday uh, at 6.30. So if you have questions about that, you can see Samantha uh, Brewer. Uh, there is a senior dinner April the 27th at 6 p.m. here at the building. It says wear your poodle skirts and leather, leather jackets to a 50s themed senior dinner. Uh, so uh, I encourage you guys to come out and join us for that, uh, those who might be in that senior category. Uh, I'll let you guys decide what a, the senior category is here. So I don't want to, actually I, w I would pick on some people, but I don't see some of the people that I'd pick on around, so I'll, I'll leave it alone for right now. Uh, gospel meetings. We, uh, we do have a gospel meeting May the 5th through the 8th uh, at Chafee Road. And uh, if you recall, for our men's day this year, we had Joe Wells come and speak. Joe's actually back in town again, uh, speaking at Chafee Road, uh, the 5th through the 8th of, uh, of May. Uh, the final thing that we'll mention is in relationship to some of the uh, work that we're doing outside of, uh, of the walls here, uh, there is a calendar of the April events up for Taylor Manor. So if you're uh, want to go over there and do some, you know, do some volunteering over at Taylor Manor uh, and Villas. Feel free to check out the calendar that's on the bulletin board. The final thing I'll mention is that we have gone ahead and posted Brian Howard's address up on the uh, bulletin board. So if you uh, if you would like to send Brian a note uh, and welcoming him to the congregation here. Uh, you know, he's supposed to be coming around the beginning of June, uh, but if you wanted to send him a note before that, you've got his address uh, there as well. Any other announcements I may have missed? No? All right, so to begin, uh, to begin today, I want to begin with a quick recap. And, and I, I will often do this with our class over this quarter is we're, I'm going to expect for you to at least have an idea about what we talked about the prior week uh, as, we, as we go into class. So uh, beginning with this, last week we spent time in Acts the 18th chapter. Acts the 18th chapter uh, told us about what? What did we study about in Acts 18? Not everybody at once. Okay, it wasn't Paul writing to Corinth, but Paul visiting Corinth for the first time. So Paul, it was Paul's initial visit to the people at Corinth. And we talked a little bit about, uh, about the, the Corinth that I, I mentioned that I had a, uh, that I did not necessarily have the, 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 you know, some of the stuff up on the screen that maybe we should. I want to point out today is just to share a little bit of detail just so you can visualize, hey, whenever we talk about Corinth, what are we talking about here? And if you look up top here, you'll see uh, whenever we talk about Corinth, Corinth is in Greece. So I put up a, a map of the entire Europe up there so you can take a look at that. Uh, so whenever we think about Greece, the, uh, you, know, you can see it there in the southeast corner of, uh, of the map there. And if we drill in a little bit closer, if you look, Greece has a ton of little islands there. And we talked about, uh, about Corinth being right near this isthmus. And you can see that narrow strip of land that separates those two bodies uh, of water. And we talked about one of the reasons why Corinth uh, as, a, as a city was successful was its location uh, and its proximity to those. And we talked about the idea that one of the things that they would do is they made a way for smaller boats to be able to make it across that land or through that area there uh, to actually avoid going all the way down around uh, the, the southern part of the, uh, if we want to call it peninsula, is that the right word there? Uh, down around, around there so it could save people time and uh, again the safety of not having to go there. Now last week we, we mentioned briefly and I, I said that we would come back to it. We talked a little bit about some of uh, the religions that were, you know, present in uh, in uh, Corinth at the time. Whenever Paul was there, you know, with it being Greek, uh, you had a lot of false, you know, a lot of idolatry that was there at that time. 
Uh, so they worshipped a number of gods, lowercase gods, uh, in, in Greece at this point. And you'll see, as we, as we look through this, you'll see some of the allusions back to that because they were, you know, some of the things that they struggled with in Corinth had their roots in their worship of these uh, idols. Um, now, uh, with that, there's a couple of different ones that I'll, I'll mention I think we talked about uh, last time, we talked about the fact that, uh, that Aphrodite was one of those that they actually worshipped. I grabbed some notes off of, uh, from a gentleman up in the Midwest from some of his comments about the religion in Corinth. Now, I'll read just a little bit. And this one, the, the first piece is a uh, quote from, uh, from the Bibli a biblical world in pictures. It says, a famous, a famous temple to Aphrodite stood at the summit of the Acheronth in the Classical Age. So the Acheronth here is basically a tall spot that was outside of the main city of Corinth. It was the highest place near Corinth. It's about 1,500 feet above, uh, above sea level. And that's kind of, that's what this is, what, what you see here. Now, I tried to see if I could find any of the ruins of the Temple of Aphrodite. Wasn't able to find it. Uh, you'll see I did find the Temple of Apollo, some of the ruins there. But getting back to this, uh, whatever we say the Acheronth is referring to that high place there. It said it had fallen into ruin by Paul's time, but successors uh, to its 1,000 cult prostitutes continued in to apply their profession in the city below. Many of them were no doubt housed in the lofts above 33 wine shops uncovered in the modern excavations. Corinth was a city catering to sailors and traveling salesmen. Even by the classical age, it had earned an unsavory reputation for its libertine atmosphere. Uh, to call someone a, a Corinth lass was to impugn her morals. Uh, it may well be that one of Corinth's attractions for Paul was precisely the reputation of immorality. And it talks about the, you know, again, it goes on to talk about, you know, the, the culture of what was there. Now, oftentimes you'll hear about Corinth and the thousand prostitutes in Aphrodite's temple or whatever. There seems to be, if you, if you read historians, uh, there's some conflict about whether or not that's just kind of myth or if it's actually accurate in terms of the numbers uh, that were actually there. Uh, but the reality is, very corrupt city uh, based on their uh, worship of some of these gods. Some of the other gods that you'll hear talked about, uh, the, the, you know, I had shown before the, uh, the uh, Temple of Apollo, Hermes, Poseidon, a lot of these Greek gods that you, you know, may have studied about uh, in school were things that these folks were probably exposed to in terms of their worship. So uh, with that, Dustin, you can cut off the, this. We don't need this up the, the rest of the time. I just wanted to take a minute and uh, share a couple of pictures with you guys and uh, talk about that. Now, going back to the the recap of last week. Whenever Paul went into Corinth, how did Paul go? Was he by himself? Was he with a bunch of people? How did he initially go? Well, we talked about the need to go in couples, but whenever he originally went, it initially just talks about Paul going. And we talk about once, his, once Timothy and Silas come, then it seems to be that he showed some courage there, starts speaking out more boldly about, uh, uh, about Christ and ends up, you know, basically leaving the Jews. And uh, he began actually teaching the Gentiles at that point, right? Now, with that, he met a couple of people who we see a couple of times throughout scriptures. Who were the people who he met there in Corinth? Okay, Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, we said that they were, they, what were the connections that they had? Tent makers, so they had the same profession as, as Paul did there. Uh, and then at the end of what we had read, we read uh, that what did they try and do to Paul? What did they do? 
they took him before the Roman proconsul, right? And, and basically tried to accuse him of stuff. And reality was the proconsul said, what? Do we remember what happened there? What was that? Be gone. Be gone. Thank you, Mike. So they basically did not want to, uh, did not necessarily want to be dealing with what they saw as, as a Jewish skirmish and said, be gone. And so uh, the, the Jews did something that felt a little irrational uh, to me is they, they took the, uh, the head of the synagogue and they beat him instead of, on this. And you see that Sosthenes, uh, was beat, beat at that point. Uh, so that's where we ended, uh, ended up with, uh, with Acts chapter 18 last week. So today we're going to pick up in, in 1 Corinthians 1. And we're going to cover more than what the book actually has because there's a couple reasons why I want to do that. There's a couple points that I want to make before and after it uh, with some of what the content that's in there. So we're going to probably move fairly quickly through some of this stuff. But at the same time, uh, if you've got a comment to make on some of it, feel free to, uh, to jump in here. So let's begin uh, 1 Corinthians 1, and we're going to uh, read verse 1 through 3. It says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all, in, with all who in every place call in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace to you and peace from God and Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here, as we see the intro to the Corinthians here, a couple things that you'll notice. We talked about some of this on Wednesday night, and I, I, told, I told Jerry, I'm like, hey, we're, some of the stuff you, you covered tonight kind of has overlap because we're, we're talking about some of it today. You'll notice here at the beginning, he identifies himself as an apostle, which Jerry, I'm not going to recap some of the stuff Jerry covered on Wednesday night, but you'll notice with Philippi, he didn't necessarily call himself an apostle as he, uh, as he did here. The second thing is, is that I want to mention, who do we see mentioned with Paul here in the letter to Corinth? Sosthenes. What, ha- what did we just say? Where did we see him the last time uh, that we left off in Acts 18? He had gotten beaten. So we're not 100% sure that this is the same Sosthenes that had actually been talked about in uh, in Acts 18, who was the ruler of the synagogue. But if this was, keep in mind, earlier in Acts 18, whenever we looked at this, we also see another Jew come over to, uh, to serve Christ. And who was that? Does anybody remember who that was and what his role was? We saw Crispus come over. What was Crispus' role in, in terms of the Jews then as well? So he was the ruler of the synagogue as well, right? So now, if this is the Sosthenes that we're talking about, Paul seems to have been pretty successful in terms of convincing people that, hey, this Jesus that we're talking about is fulfillment of Old Testament Scripture, and you need to follow him if two of the rulers of the synagogue have potentially come over and begun serving, uh, serving Christ. Uh, so it's kind of, again, you don't necessarily, if you just read the intro there, you don't necessarily uh, realize the impact of if this is the Sosthenes. You know, if it is, it really tells a, a story about the impact of what Paul was able to accomplish uh, there in, in, the, in Corinth. So uh, let's go ahead and jump into the text of what we're supposed to be covering in the book today. Uh, We're going to begin with with verses 4 through 9. It says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge. Even as the testimony of Christ Jesus was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, as we, as we 
talk about this. Jerry pointed out on Wednesday that, uh, that Paul often gives thanks to, uh, uh, about the churches that he is uh, you know, writing to. He talks about giving thanks for those, those folks. Have you ever, whenever thinking about the church at Corinth, does it, is there anything, and again, we haven't gotten to this study, so I'm drawing on your knowledge already of, of, of the church at Corinth, but is there anything that makes it surprising to you that Paul would be saying, hey, I thank God always for you? What's, is there any irony in that? What's, what's the irony? Okay. 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 Anything else that might be odd that Paul would be saying, thank you for, thank you for this church? Okay, so they weren't necessarily known for their submission to doctrine, right? What, what were some of the problems that they had that we're going to talk about this quarter? Does anybody... Think about things. Fornication was a big one. You know, there were issues going on in that church that if if that was happening here, we'd be like, oh, (laughs) I'm not sure I'm thinking them for that congregation. I don't know. That's 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 tough. What else did we what else did we see see going on? Okay, we're, we see where, where the people in the church, and we'll talk a little bit about it today, but we see division amongst the members of the church there, right? The, uh, so much so where they're taking their brother to court instead of solving things inside. What else do we see? We see idolatry. Ad- yeah, adultery was... Yep, yeah, both idolatry and adultery as a part of that, Right? So, so there's a lot of reasons why we could sit there and, you know, uh, just a couple other things that I, that I had listed down here. I talked about just the open immorality. It wasn't even that it was necessarily hidden uh, from everybody. People knew about what was going on here. Uh, we've implied it with the, talking about taking a brother to court, but it's, it's also just the division amongst the, the people there. So there's a lot of reasons why, you know, Paul could look at this and just jump in right into blasting uh, this church in, in, in Corinth. But the reality is, is he begins his letter by saying, I thank my God for you. Jerry? And sometimes that's a good approach for us to learn about people. Don't just come hit them head on right off the bat. Because I'm not Yep, Dawson. Also, obviously it was the church, and the city of Corinth is noted for all these things, certainly, because it was just rampant throughout that, that part of the world. Then. And then the church here is trying to be a remnant of, for Christ, and, and you know, it's an established church, and yet some of that stuff is taken through in the church. So there's still probably were some good, faithful people among that. I mean, that's the yeah. It's interesting with what Jerry said. Is I I feel like you know I think we've heard the uh, the phrase uh, about you know people really don't care what you have to say unless they know that you love them unless they know that you care for them and if we jump in right to blasting people sometimes it's not going to have nearly the impact of if I have a relationship with you and I have a, a candid conversation. Uh, you know that doesn't mean that everybody who you love and care for are going to really care when you share. And, and, and push back on them that they're doing something sinful. Uh, but if you don't have a relationship with someone and you immediately go in and start blasting them, it's going to be going to be tough for you to uh, to really have the impact you want to on on that. Uh, you know, it also brings up and, and this is just another opportunity for me to you just hit on this as I, I feel so blessed to have this congregation here at Lake Forest. And, and Jerry talked about us giving thanks for one another. 
uh, you know, on Wednesday night. But it's just a, another point here uh, that it's so important that we think about the people who we're surrounding ourselves with and being thankful for the people who we've got here at Lake Forest. You know, looking at Proverbs 13, verse 20, it says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. If you contrast that with a, a verse that comes at the end of 1 Corinthians, in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, it says that evil company corrupts good morals. So what's the message of those two things? Well, if it says, he who walks with wise men will be wise, and then it says evil company is going to corrupt good habits or good morals, what's the message there? What, stay, stay away. That wasn't where I was going. What is it, what is it saying there? Well, here we, evil companions are corrupting good morals. So the message is, is that we are going to become like the people who we are around, right? Um, a motivational speaker, uh, Jim Rohn, had said, you are the average of the top five people who you spend the most time with. You're the average of the top five people who you spend the most time with. So it's kind of interesting if you think about that. So if you, if you want to be more godly, you need to find yourself surrounding yourself by people who you're around. Or you need to, who are more godly. You know, if you want to do something, if you want to be more successful in some way, you got to find someone who is more successful in that way to hang around. And what's going to happen is over time, they're probably going to make you a little bit more successful. So just something for us to think about whenever we think about, hey, thanking God for, for our church, for his church, you know, we should be thankful for people like you guys here who keep us honest and keep us on the right path because we influence one another. That's why it's important that you're here. That's why it's important that I'm here is because you build me up and I build you up, hopefully, by our, just even the presence and being involved in some of the stuff that we've got going on here at Lake Forest. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and move on to verses 10 through, um, 10 through 12 here. It says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you will all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning my, bre my brethren by, the by those of Chloe's households, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, uh, now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. As we, as we uh, go in and start looking at this, we're starting to see that there's division in Corinth, right? Uh, you know, we're not going to dive into all the different spots where there's division. We're going to see that as we go through the book of 1 Corinthians. But as we go through 1 Corinthians, you should realize that division is one of the, main, one of the major themes that you see in Scripture here that you should be paying attention, attention to as we go further and get further into the book. Now, what is causing the, divi uh, the division that's being spoken of here in... in uh, the chapter one of First Corinthians. Is it well? So it's baptism, but is it baptism itself, or is it who's baptizing? Right? It, it's I was baptized by Jerry, or I was baptized by Dawson. It, it, it's it's one of those things. Um, you know, as we as we look at that, do we ever have? Is it possible for us to be? divided in the same way that the Corinthians were being divided? You know, it happens, right? You know, I, I, what is beautiful is uh, I, I think this congregation has shown some strength in not being divided. We just have gone through a time that could have easily divided us in many ways with losing Ryan and, you know, trying to find a new minister. You know, if you, if, you look at, uh, if you look at the people who are mentioned here uh, as to the, the ones that were mentioned, it's kind of interesting the ones that he talks about. Am I of Paul or am I of Paulus? Flip over to Acts 18.24 for a second. You might see why they might have been divided a little bit. 
If you look at Acts 18.24, it actually tells us a little bit about Apollos. And it tells us, in Acts 18.24, it says, Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in scriptures, came to Ephesus. What does that tell us uh, about Apollos? Is he a good speaker? Okay, he, he knew his word, he knew the word of God, and he knew how to speak it and bring it. Do we like preachers who know their word, who know the word of God, and preach it the way they should? Oh yeah, absolutely, right? And then you think about Paul, and if you flip over to, uh, if you flip over and take a look at 2 Corinthians 10, uh, Paul refers to himself and talks a little bit about himself in 2 Corinthians 10. Now, is this Paul kind of downplaying his... His abilities, who knows? But if you look at 2 Corinthians 10, and I'm going to pick up in verse 7 there, it, uh, it says, Do you look at things according to the outward appearance? If anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ, let him again consider this in himself, that just as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. For even if I should boast somewhat, somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us, for edification and not for your destruction, I, have, I, I shall not be ashamed, lest I seem to terrify you by letters. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful. But listen to this. What does it say? So his letters are weighty and powerful. We read Paul's letters. Weighty, powerful. I think that we can attest to that as to what Paul brings in scriptures. But it says... For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. So Paul is seeming to say, while I might be able to write well, you know, my oratory skills may not necessarily be as good as others would like. So it seems to be saying, hey, we have some divisions here. It doesn't, you know, he talks about, you know, being baptized by these people, but I'm wondering... Could it be just like we have today of, you know, we sometimes like to hear one preacher speak. We like to hear one person speak. Uh, you guys might like Wednesday nights because Jerry's teaching right now and you don't like coming Sunday mornings because you just got David speaking on Sunday, Sunday morning for class. Uh, so there's some of that that possibly could infiltrate the church here today. You know, so it's, we got to be careful about allowing divisions that are really not necessarily scriptural matters to divide the church. Throughout scripture, we read examples of where division is, is, you know, talked about. We can look John 17, verse 11. What's happening in John 17? Anybody remember? This is Jesus praying in the garden right before he's about to be crucified. In John 17, 11, he says, Now I am no longer in this world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father, that you that keep them through your name, those whom I have given, given me, that they may be one as we are. Jesus is praying that we, as followers of Christ, should be one just as he and the Father are. If you look at Titus chapter 3, verse 10 to 11, it says, Reject the device of man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. Romans 16, verse 17, it says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. You know, in the first century here, think about the church at Corinth. You had a lot of things that could have divided those people. You know, what are some of the things that could have divided those people? Not necessarily scripturally speaking, but are there, are there things that were different about the people who may have become Christians at Corinth? Okay? Could, could be business trans. You think about just general things. You had uh, people who were the rulers of the synagogue, possibly, you know, who were worshiping there at the same time. You had Gentiles who would have never been accepted by uh, the Jews. So you had some differences in background of culture that, that were happening there. You had, you know, we can, we can look at other scriptures where we see, and, and was this 
totally present in Corinth. You know, I'm, I imagine it probably was. You've got people who had money and people who didn't have money. We can think about some scriptures in James where it talks us, tells us to be careful about some of those, show impartiality to those things. Uh, but those things happen. You know, you could have uh, situations related to, you know, just men and women, differences there, uh, educated, not educated. You, you had a lot of those things. And when you want to get back and think about it, some of that stuff might, not, might be a little foreign to us. We, the idea of a Jew-Gentile relationship, we weren't Jews, so we didn't understand that as well. But, you know, we think about some of the differences in our culture today. You know, reality is, is that there's differences in our culture. I'm white. Jerry's not. There's a difference in the culture that we come from. Uh, there's, there's people who are more educated. There are people who don't have as much as other people do. There's a lot of differences that we can allow to drive divisions in our church today. We are never going to be perfect. There are still going to be some natural things that we, we find differences are, and we're never going to be perfect on this. But we need to strive to not allow these things that are physical things in this world to separate us because really we have that one bond, and that's Christ. So that's not saying that we are perfect by any means, but we need to always keep that in mind that we can't let physical differences here on this earth separate us uh, as, as a part of, of our Christian walk here. It's fair. It's fair. It yeah. Yeah. And you think about what these folks were dealing with back then, and it was a lot of, you know, they were a lot tighter than what we are today. You know, they were meeting in everybody's houses, and it was, there was a much tighter bond uh, that they had in those days than what, what we have today, because we, you know, we drive from 20, 40 miles apart and come a couple times a week, and we don't necessarily always build the relationships that we should. And that's on us, too. That's, that's absolutely... Right, that we, we need to make sure that we're building the relationships or division won't matter because we won't even have a relationship to divide. So, very good point. Were you about to say something, Jerry? Okay. I couldn't tell if that hand was going up right there. All right, let's go ahead. Acts 13, or Acts, excuse me, Rome, 1 Corinthians 1, 13 through 17. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized him in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether or not I baptized any other, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel not of, with wisdom of words, lest the cross uh, should, the, excuse me, what, lest the cross of Christ should be made no effect. So here, again, it just continues the concept of division. Uh, it, Paul starts out with a series of rhetorical questions in this section that attempts to put the Corinthians back in the correct frame of mind. You know, these questions may seem a little silly, but it, it really was meant to uh, make them think through the error of what, they, uh, of what had happened. Uh, you know, we, we think about some of these things. Uh, and we think about, you know, is it, it seems silly to think about whether or not Paul was crucified for these people because he's sitting here writing a letter, uh, you know. So there's, there's a number of things that he does there, but it just reemphasizes the, the point of we, we need to make sure that we're not allowing divisions to happen. So for just a second here, because I want to, I've, I've got five minutes here. For two minutes, I want us to think about practical reasons why or how we avoid the divisions in the church today. So this is for you to tell me, how do we avoid division in the church today? We've already got one, is to avoid division, we've got to be in a place to have division. We need to have relationships. And reality is, is sometimes we're not building the relationships that we should 
in the church, you know. So that, that means that we've got to have relationships first. But what are some practical ways that we can avoid division in the church today? Mike. Okay. Okay. All right. Bill. Okay. Strong leadership is, is key. Uh, we're we're going to, I'm going to take David and then I'm going to jump because I'm going to run out of time. Okay. Correct. Okay. All right. You got a thumbs up in the back by uh, Dustin too. I usually don't see thumbs up in the middle of services, but I got a thumb up from, uh, from Dustin there. So great point, Dave. So the first thing I had was let's make God's standard our source of unity rather than our own preferences. And uh, I'm not going to read them because we're going to run out of time. Ephesians 4, 11 through 15, something you can go back and read if you want to. Uh, the second thing I would say is in order for us to have unity, there's going to be conflict, but we need to be careful with how we use our words. The way we use our words can have a big impact. You can say things and, you know, that, that can really divide people really quick without even giving much thought to it. That doesn't mean we should avoid conflict because conflict is necessary at times, but it does mean that we should be very thoughtful with how we are handling that. If you want to, you can look at 2 Timothy 2, verse 14 through 17. And along with that, I had, we need to handle whenever there is, you know, our disputes among us, we need to make sure that we're handling those things with love. And you can look at Galatians 6, verses 1 through 4 on those. Uh, but ultimately, it's going to come back to, we've got to have a common, you know, a, uh, the common belief that Christ is our Savior, and this is the standard for everything that we're doing. And that's going to drive unity. I want to just take just a minute more, and I know we've got two minutes here. I want to read just a little bit past where our book reads, because I, it, it just, the book doesn't cover it, and I just feel like it, our culture today kind of hits on this a little bit. Beginning of verse 18, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are preaching, perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach God or Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You know, I, I, I want to get to this section because I feel like that we are now in a society that is turning further and further away from God. Uh, I, I wanted to give you an example of this. There was a shooting at a school in Tennessee uh, just last year. And I want to read you a couple of quotes that were actually were written after that shooting. 
uh, and I, I found this somewhere. It says a progressive talk, talk show host wrote on Twitter, very surprising that there would be a mass shooting at a Christian school given the lack of prayer is often blamed for these horrible events. Is it possible they weren't praying enough or correctly despite being a Christian school? An investigative journalist tweeted, your thoughts and prayers are not working. Praying only works if you make the change, changes to help. A film composer tweeted, the people at the Christian school in Nashville prayed that their children would be safe. How did that work out? You know, we've got a lot of people who are mocking Christianity, who talk about this and, and treat it like they did at the end of 1 Corinthians 1 and say it's foolishness that you believe in a God. Guys, let's not lose our faith. Let's make sure that we understand the world can say what it wants to. You know, I, I was, as I was thinking about this, set of, this portion of 1 Corinthians 1, I remember sitting in the congregation somewhere around this, the middle section uh, just a number of years ago and someone asking about our preacher, about the degree that he had. And he didn't have a PhD, so this guy thought that his church was much better than the church here at Lake Forest because his, his preacher had a doctorate degree. And it's amazing to me that we just continue to go through cycles where people say that this is foolishness. Reality is it's not. We need to make sure we're keeping the faith. All right. Well, thank you, guys.